Okay, we're going to look into birds and divination and uh, specialize on one bird in particular in this. Uh, this crow, this bird of night or mystery that we know of today and they knew back then this bird is extremely intelligent and uh, will do all kinds of things. Uh, most of the people that are interacted with this bird uh, had already domesticated many animals and had done falconry and things along that line so to a mess with a magpie or to a mess with a raven was not too far out of their reach this we see is a depiction here who you would think that it's Elminster or perhaps it's somebody like Gandalf but this is a depiction of Odin and his two ravens that he had, and uh, Hugin and Munin. And uh, Hugin was, uh, it was pretty much looked like as Hugin was intelligence and Munin is wisdom. I hope I don't have those mixed up. One was like his thoughts and the other one is, was his memory. In fact, in one occasion he talked about it where he really didn't want to lose one, but he feared worse of losing the other and the concept that people are supposed to get out of that almost an Aesop's fable if you will is the idea that he uh, he didn't mind losing his current thought like what were we talking about but he didn't want to lose his intelligence and his smarts and what he had accrued so anyhow uh, there are a lot of depictions that go along with Odin and there's going to be a lot of pictures here that go with that but necessarily it not all history goes with Odin there in his witch's hat seen as the one-eyed god and even in the movies in recent times they put it in there a little bit and I always say it's in your face but it's only in your face if you know anything about it and uh, most people don't know much or anything about it but we know that there are birds looked at as being symbols or something that gives you a sign. There was a birds of wisdom. There's the wise old owl that we all talk about. But then again, you would take something that was smart, intelligent, crafty, Loki-ish, if you will, and it would be your spies as far as birds go. And this was looked at as being big brothers watching you the eye of Odin is upon you, but it stems back to early Proto-Indo-European thoughts. And so when I tell you that there was multiple waves that people talk about, of people coming into what we call Northern Europe and Europe in the day, and genetics is starting to show that reality now, that there was two waves that came through and they went through many places far to the east far to the southeast down even into Egypt and North Africa all through Anatolia the area in between and up into Europe where we mostly think of these Aryan or Proto-Indo-European people type being at um, so Odin is seen as having a raven always and he sends them out it says uh, and ironically it seems to go with that Greek parable too that go back with their gods for Zeus released two doves and they encircled the earth and whenever they met he knew that was the belly button of the earth and that was where they put the Amphalos at and uh, Oracle of Delphi and situations like that but in the elder times there was three different places that were signified as being the actual belly button of the earth but I'm not going to get into that totally into that but ravens are seen as one of the birds of the archetypal type if you will of these omen birds that would tell you certain things that would give you a sign if you would say that and you think that we don't have anything like that today but if I was to mention such things as um, a little bird told me that 
in the sense of a spy situation and you would blame it on the birds that you do today and you know that 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 is still excellent we still have that today but you don't know where it comes from but it's still used but thus quote the raven no more also has connotations of this omen situation and Damien the omen has it in there too doesn't it and they're omens and uh, omen birds for for a whole, all of the world from thunderbirds in the Americas to the ancient birds and, and things of old and uh, you look at the Iliad and the Odyssey in there and they definitely talk about them and an eagle leads the way and and so on and everything and ravens were at one time if you will very much like a black cat and when a raven crossed your path you knew that perhaps Odin was either with you or watching what you're doing bud and there was that thought of that but this idea of a proto-Indo-European raven the smart bird, the intelligent bird that assists man can be seen all the way back to the early Proto-European cloak that I just showed recently from hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and way back before the time of any of the people that were thinking of the Celts and everything. And, of course, these tales of Odin come from before the Vikings, too, the Norse are rich with an idea like that, but in that idea of all these people having a rich idea like that, the people right around the Black Sea definitely had a rich idea like that, and these crows, or these ravens, would be the messengers in some way and tell you things, but there was another bird that was quite the messenger or one that would just give signs so maybe he wasn't quite as intelligent and was used in a different way as a messenger like a dove or the pigeon and their relationship with each other is another thing that is seen throughout history but let's see if I can attach them to different stories well you see the Greeks and Minoans are famous for using ravens and doves whenever they go out in ships and doing maritime things as you're seeing here in the picture. For they would be an omen, especially in bad seas or when they felt like they were lost in any way. And so which bird would they use? Well, they were smart in this way for this dove or pigeon usually would head home. Now this is goes back to before recorded time when men would understand some things and when birds were frightened they would go home. If there was a storm they could release him in that storm and they have a sense of direction that man could lose his direction but this bird Say it's all cloudy like it is during a storm and you cannot see the stars. And you might be able to hedge by the stars, but pre-compass and a, and a churning sea, what would you do? And believe it or not, it carried all the way up in the maritime times and times of pirates. And it's why you see certain things and parrots are always mentioned with pirates and stuff. It's an homage situation. And it really goes back to this idea where if they were looking for home, they would release a dove or a pigeon, like a homing pigeon, for he would go home no matter where you got him lost at or head that way. But ravens would look for land, and they were smart, and they would get up in the sky and try hard to find land, right? But you don't think that you see that necessarily in... Uh, mythology and you, and you don't think that it's extant in your your books that you know of and so on but double-headed birds are quite frequented in a lot of these people's mythology and then again whenever you look at something like this and this idea of Valkyries and how they were led by birds 
and then these people were also migrating it shows you another thing one other quick attachment before I throw you a, a, a good decent reveal here too is the idea that people watch the bird for birds for omens a, a flocks literally turning which way they turned and so on was an art that is shown in ancient Greece and a few other civilizations Mitanni and a few others Etruscans and so on that have this uh, things might change because of birds going certain ways and all this type of thing and people can't quite understand it but I'll give you an example of that too um, whenever you see the ducks start showing up and swans and things you might after experiencing it quite a few times know that that must be the end of the season and then whenever they disappear and you start to see flocks of them heading south there's a reason for that for here comes on the winter and even though you do go by lunar calendars and you have that all figured out winter can start early or late too so you look at signs from the birds and we still do that today I remember when we were kids seeing giant flocks of ducks and everything and my granddad saying well it's gonna be an early winter this year and da 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 and sure enough like go we went from wearing not even pants yet but we had to have jackets and stuff on within a week didn't snow or anything but then it did boy it snowed big time and stuff and so on and I uh, and uh, it was just an early winter and he kinda recognized by what time they were there and what had time he usually sees them and that's how almanacs were given and all these things and there were signs given by creatures all of the time but you don't think that shows up everywhere but I'm, I'm telling you it shows up everywhere for Inanna had all kinds of things that were attached to ideas of doves in fact the ancient belief was that she had taken the wild dove and turned the pigeon itself into a creature and the fact that it hones to home back to Samaria back to its homeland was something that was given to him by the gods through here her work with birds and you see a lot of bird symbology and especially these doves and situations even Gilgamesh when Enkidu dies and all these things but I'll tell you another one and it's a double correlation that I've talked about it many times but whenever Utnapishtim is told by Enki when Enki is just talking to a wall so he's not really telling the men that the flood's gonna come and to build a boat and everything he has him he mentions the birds and they have birds with them whenever they go <coughs> in the flood that is the Sumerian flood and that's where the story of the Bible flood comes from and it literally was all of the Tigris and Euphrates flood over and in between they talk about it and it would have been somewhat 17 18 feet and in in the biblical story if you look at it it ends up being the same cubits height type situation in that area and then they say above the hills and everything but I guess anything but hills around it wouldn't have been above the Zagros mountains and all the things that we try to envision on it today but let me get past that and go on with birds for they had doves and then they let loose a raven and so on and he comes back and everything so what was this so they let loose doves to go home and there was no home and they came back and there was great sadness and so he released another one and he came back so there was neither form of home if you follow what I'm saying that where you used to live is not yours anymore and that home no longer exists also for these people right and this story is not a Sumerian one necessarily for that same idea and concept is carried in Proto-Indo-Europeans into every culture that they actually touched upon and it's where we get a lot of the flood stories but Noah also released a dove the raven and so on and then then oh they then back comes the dove who had a branch and that told him that he had not found home but whenever they sent the second time he found a home and then no longer was it in Sumeria for Sumeria was gone 
and washed under. And in the lament for Ur, it definitely talks about the destruction that there was there and so on. And so where did those people go after that? Well, it tells you clearly in there that somehow the Elamites came into that area after they had left and that they had gone up the Tigris and Euphrates way back up into that area. And Well, where did uh, Noah land? Well, he landed in Ararat. It's right up there near the Caucasus Mountains and stuff. And that's supposedly where all the different Caucasian came out of that reformulated mankind, which would have been again through the Sumerian Valley up into north area, which we would, I guess, call Russia, and then left into Europe all the way beckoning into the edge of China, down towards India, and you have the Hamites, which all came into Anatolia and the lower area there around the Mediterranean on the bottom side, and half of Mediterranean and North uh, Africa and Egypt. And if uh, you look at the ancient where it tells you Caucasian race, it even tells you okay, went to the Horn of Africa. So then also Yemen and things also too. So it um, didn't necessarily contain, contain you know, tales of the Arabic people and so on, but they also contain and get an attachment to the Abrahamic Bible situation and now uh, have their own Islamic beliefs, which came much later, but that's not for this video. But these birds that we talked about and these crows oh and I know there's a couple of important things that I'm leaving out here totally but from tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey to tales all the way from the east and definitely into what we refer to as Asia to the Europeans and their stories even up into modern times and thus quote the Raven and Eleanor and all those you know, stories of Poe, as in like Poseidon, but Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, if you've ever read that whole tale, it shows you a connection too, but whatever they have, their flood story, there's also birds involved with that situation. And then the maritime people is well known that they used these birds and that is thrown in that Sumerian tale refigured as your Bible by the people and it shows you a definite connection of all those people but where did that original story came from well it came from before that for it actually is in all of those people's stories isn't it yeah from Danish type people and Vikings to the ancient Celts and what we call Europeans today to Romans and of course Greeks and Anatolians and their stories and of course Horus and the idea and falconry and situations that go along with this in Egypt but also in Samaria there are tales and you can also tell how they envelope and change over time and of course different people had different flares on it but this one easy thing to see is that I have doves and I have ravens and I'm on a boat and I use them in a way to find home or somewhere and I end up having to leave and home is no more and I find somewhere and that's a connection that most people can't make whenever they talk about the doves and the raven that they send and what the hell is that supposed to all mean and what it does really mean and shows you connections back to the time whenever the birds used to actually eat the person and they would leave him up on a dais and take him to heaven and that these birds were smart they were like the gods they were given the gift of flight they were the first conceptual angels taking you to heaven in that type of situation and the raven being one that was very smart was apparently one that was attached to the gods and because of the sneaky nature of the crow or the raven itself rather than the overwatching effect like you might see of a hawk or eagle or a falcon as in Horus it's a counterpart situation it's his own Loki it's his own counterpart and he sent them out to find the ends of the earth in Odin's story 
much like in the Greek story, every day and throughout the day they went through the whole earth finding out, hey, what's up? And came back at sunrise, sunset and would tell him what was going on in the world. And this also attaches to spies and advisors and situations. And no, they weren't using them like a homing pigeon with messages yet, but they were getting messages from them. And somebody finally was smart enough to, and instead of sending the bird out to know that something happened, I'm going to wrap a little note around them and tell them what happened with the bird and it's going to go home. You can see the divination factor even in movies like Willow. And uh, in Willow, if you remember right, whenever they were supposed to take the little daikini child, because they were the dwarven people, right? They were the pecks. Out of the way, peck. And so what did they do? Well, they he threw a dove. He, he magically showed up a dove, and everybody's like, wow. And then he goes, follow the bird. He throws it up, but actually it goes up and turns and goes back home. What is that? That's a dove. And he goes, forget the bird. Follow the river right and because where it's supposed to be well the daikini lived down the river you'd think the bird would go that way but actually it's just a homing bird and it's about that time of day whenever the girl brings food so it thinks about that and goes where it's supposed to whereas a raven might go towards food and that's why in these maritime situations in these Celtic people and Mediterranean people they talked about using ravens for that situation and finding a new area of land and when they found new land, they would follow the birds to see if they could find food. And when people are extremely hungry, they'll even try to eat a freshly killed carrion by some other creature. And perhaps they will find buzzards. And buzzards show them that there's something over there that they wouldn't know is over there. It's another thing is signs of birds and weather coming. How bad's the weather going to be? The birds are coming this way. It's going to be bad. They're leaving that area coming flying this way so on. So anyhow, that's just one touching upon it, and I want to show you another connection, another wheel on the cog that shows you these interconnected people and their stories from ancient times that lead to biblical tales and mythology, and it's all interwoven and uses uh, the same symbology in many cases and most in the exact same ways. Anyhow, like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy. Peace.